and I think that's kind of a good segue into the next question, if you don't mind me asking you, kind of putting you on the spot for this. But our next question is talking about whenever students are struggling, whenever you find their students who are learning Mandarin Chinese are struggling with engaging in these online interpersonal activities, how do you personally overcome those challenges? Students who are struggling in engaging in the online activities. Yeah, so don't think students, I've ever maybe these are your quiet it. students or maybe they are, um, you know, maybe autistic, they just- Say it out loud, autistic, it's okay. I'm autistic, I'm good with it. I was thinking more, um, I come across a lot of social anxiety. I, oh, yeah. it seems every year I have a student who will kind of privately ask, can we talk in Zoom afterward? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And they will say, I'm just too shy or I, I maybe they feel like they are not understanding. A lot of that imposter syndrome too. I find a lot of students have that imposter syndrome because they in their heads are thinking, oh, I should be at this level, but you know, hey, you've only just started and that's okay. We're all starting at some point. So if you have situations like that, how do you as an educator personally try to help those students overcome those situations? Um, speaking, if I'm in a public school situation, for example, um, the first thing I'm gonna do is go to the guidance counselor. Is there something on this kid's record that I'm not aware of? Um, the first week of school, I have already called that child's parents because I call the parents of every child the first week of school. Before there's a problem, you call them and you say, hey, Mrs. Jones, this is your child's Chinese teacher. And I just wanted to say, I am so looking forward to having George in class this year. He's got such a great smile. I can tell he's a neat kid. You know, and I'd like to encourage you to email me anytime you, you feel that there's something that, that needs to be said to me, okay, or that you just like to say. And that, that investment of time gets me a lot over the course of the year, because when George turns out to be a kid who is unidentified ADHD or something, and he just can't control himself in class, I can call his mom. And his mom already views me as an equal, as a friend, not as, oh, my God, the phone's ringing and somebody's complaining about George again. What did he do now? You know, so it gives me a, a different point of departure with that parent. Um, besides that, I'm just going to essentially let them do what they do. As long as it's not seriously affecting anyone else's you know, problem. But you were asking more about those who are having problems interacting, not those who are over interacting. So let me get back on the other side of the, the, the coin there. Um, if I have quiet students, I frequently find autistic students in my classes who may or may not be identified. Now, uh, the most recent one was I had one in a high school class who just ticked all the boxes but had not been identified. And she was not going to be a speaker. She just was not going to speak. And I'm like, well, you know what? That's okay because people acquire language by listening and reading, not by speaking. Practice does not make proficient, okay? Practice doesn't make proficient. So if she doesn't speak, she doesn't move her mouth during class, that's okay. As long as she has some way that she can comfortably demonstrate to me at some point that she does understand. And actually, even if she doesn't, because I'm gonna trust my kids. I had a kid, a sixth grader who put his head down the whole semester never looked up. He still acquired language. Not as much as those who had been, you know, ah, oh, with their hands in the air and activity, but they did acquire. So in terms of acquiring and all that, I really feel like there's a lot of room in the world today, especially we don't know what generational traumas our kids come with. We don't know what their current economic situation is. Are they living in their car? Do they know where they're going to sleep tonight? Did they eat? These are all questions that we are seeing more and more in our classes. So I can't expect Susie's first priority to be answering up in great Mandarin if she is insecure. Remember Maslow's hierarchy, right? If she doesn't have that first layer fixed, Chinese is self-actualization. It's not eating and being safe. So all of these things, I think, are the first things to consider. So I'm going to give Susie a pass, you know, and try to find out what the thing is, talk to other teachers, talk to guidance, talk to the parents, see if there's a way we can fix it, you know? But even if she doesn't speak, she'll acquire. She has a brain, she speaks a first language, she's good. Absolutely, and there is sort of that element of, we need to recognize that 
our students are just different individuals. So acquiring language might look very different for John than it does for James. And just, hey, that is what it is. Um, I will certainly vouch as an online educator. For me personally, it seems like every year I always get some sort of surprise. And it's a reminder that we don't always know what's going on at the other end of the computer screen. And I personally have just learned to always show grace and keep that door open for communication. My students know that they can always come to me if they've got concerns or just need to talk about things. And, and what you talked about, sort of investing those coins in that piggy bank at the beginning of the year, building the connection with the student and the parent. So when you have to come to them later, if something isn't quite where we want it to be, we've already got that rapport built. So that's that's a fantastic tool. Thank you for sharing that. And always, fantastic. always, always benefit of the doubt, assume yep. good intention. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Excellent. Um, same question, and we will pass to Jin Laoshi. And the question once again was, what do you find students learning, sorry, what do you find students learning Mandarin Chinese struggle with the most when we're engaging in online and interpersonal activities? And how do you overcome these challenges? Um, I think, uh, well, I, well, and I was listening to uh, Kari Laoshi, uh, one thing you know <laughs> stuck in my mind was I kept thinking about my uh, level four class because uh, in my school district uh, we really have students coming from different background. So we have um, we have a placement test to place students into the right level. So in my level four class, it's very interesting. You you can see freshmen speaking pretty good you know, Chinese, you know, knows a lot. You can also see senior students whose language proficiency might not be as, you know, high as those freshmen, but their learning skill is really strong. So I just actually, I always tell myself, those students who invested four years into learning Chinese in their high school, they are my baby, <laughs> you know, they are, they are my babies, right? And I'm just, you know, I start to think about the, the, the seniors I just had this past school year. I actually taught them Chinese one and they learned Chinese two with a different Chinese teacher, learned Chinese three with another Chinese teacher. Now they were in my level four and all four years, you know, I had Korean students, Indian students, they, they, they had zero Chinese. So I just feel like I need to help them. I, they struggle maybe the most. On the one hand, they, I think they are aware of that. Those little, you know, little kids, their language is much stronger. You know, as senior students, they are like, oh, a little bit, you know, discouraged. I need to help them to, you know, really continue their learning. Hopefully not even just in high school. I'm, I'm hoping in college, they will continue learning Chinese, right? So one thing I did was my first group activity for the you know, first semester was I told my students, uh, whoever will have a senior student in the class, in, in the group will get extra credit. Because usually that, you know, they were like, oh, their Chinese is not as strong as, you know, as uh, me. I don't want to work in the same group with, with them. But now hey, there is an incentive. And I told uh, my freshman students, I give you a little extra work. Observe how they work. Pick up at least one skill, like learning skill or collaboration or whatever skill from those senior students and be ready to share with me what you have learned from them. So um, the second act, uh, group work, I actually said, whichever group will have a freshman who get a little extra credit, just a little, but you know, for the high school kids, extra credit matters a lot, right? So I think I'm, I'm hoping to provide students um, different opportunities to really interact work together, learn from each other, so everybody can grow, you know, uh, not just linguistically, but also, you know, uh, picking up new skills, being in, uh, inspired by, you know, their peers. And I think um, 
of course, you know, when it, when the learning was done online, it might be a little different, but I, I really want to just say, for me, uh, I might want to say those students, uh, those senior students in higher level class, they, they need the most support and they might struggle the most. And they are the students we really need to help and support a lot. And every time when I saw they did something really well, I made it a big deal. Look at, you know, this student, he just did a great, uh, you know, presentational uh, presentation. Think about how well he did and think about he started learning Chinese less than four years ago from zero. This is what he can do. And let's give him a big round of applause. So this is, I think, what I want to share on this topic. I love that. I love the idea of celebrating our students' wins. And even in the online environments, I will sometimes, if I see something, a student's really knock something out of the park, and I want to share this as an example for the other students, I might add in one of my announcements, hey, check out Josh's submission on this particular assignment or listen to this feedback from Emily it's amazing. And they're able to get that. They're learning from each other, essentially. And, and I love to incorporate that in. So thank you for sharing that. And again, the same question we will pass to Kosh Laoshi. And the question is, what do you find students learning Mandarin Chinese struggle the most with when engaging in online interpersonal activities? And how do you overcome these challenges? Sure. I think I just to echo a couple of things that have been said first, I think one of the things that was really that stood out in both of the other panelists, sort of the heart of what they're both saying is how important it is to get to know your students, right? I think so often we're, we have this sense as teachers that like we have so much content to cover. We're moving at this just breakneck pace all the time. And I'm always, what I always say to teachers is I believe you can teach it, but I don't believe that they're going to learn as much as you're here trying to teach. So if you cut 20%, out of this curriculum that you're saying you're going to sort of get through before now and the end of the semester, I think you earn back in, in spades that time you invest getting to know the students, thinking about what they're interested in, but spending that time to get at the heart of whatever it is they're struggling with. Because I think some students are struggling with Chinese. It's Chinese related. It's a self-confidence thing. It's that they haven't had enough input and we're demanding way too much output of them. There's lots of sort of language and language adjacent things that could be going on. But there's also a lot of not Chinese things that could be going on. And I think a lot of what Terry just said really gets, gets to some of that. So I guess something I would say before I talk a little bit about what to do for the language piece, I think take a deep breath and don't take it personally. Because if you do the math, and I do do the math with my students every semester, I get 52 hours of them in class a semester, 52 hours over 15 weeks. That is 1% of their time is occupied by Chinese. And my students are taking Chinese as one of four, five, six, sometimes seven classes on top of a job, a social life, the pressure of being away from their family for maybe the very first time. It's not about me. The, their world is so much bigger than me and this language stuff we're doing as much as I believe in it and love it and have dedicated my life and career to it. It's just remembering that anything that they get in the limited amount of time that you have with them is a win, anything. And that goes for day one, nothing to something, but it also is that day four, I mean, year four, like Jen Osher was just talking about remembering, look how far you've come since year one. We say things all the time. Students say things and I correct them every time they say it. I've been learning Chinese for five, for four years. False. You've been learning Chinese for like the equivalent of a week. If we, if we calculate in hours, not in weeks, months, years, or days, we realize very quickly that the amount of exposure that they've had is minuscule. And so I think it, it helps us to sort of reset some expectations and to think about sort of we're actually, anything we're doing is worth celebrating and it's great. Now to get just a little bit, oh, and, and Terry said something else, Maslow's, right? Something a, a good friend, a dear teacher, colleague, friend of mine always says is Maslow's before Bloom's, right? We can't be talking about Bloom's taxonomy if we're not talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? If we're not, if students are not getting what they need in their regular life, 
that goes far beyond school period and our Chinese class for sure, then <laughs> there's not much Bloom's taxonomy to be talked about. And those are bigger issues that we as individual Chinese teachers are not going to solve anyway. But if we get onto the language piece just for a minute and we sort of take out, even though we can't really do that because you can't take the human out of their humanity, right? But just to focus on their language related needs for a minute, I think it really is identifying the thing that they're struggling with, right? Is it is it that the student doesn't want to try to speak, right? Is it that they don't want to engage in speaking at all, that when it comes time to talk that they say no? Or is it that they're going to do it and they realize that they don't have enough resources yet? Um, I think it's it the ability to sort of diagnose, to use a word that I don't actually love, to sort of figure out what's going on is the precursor to then being able to offer them some solutions. If it's that they are going to say something and the words are not coming, I would be willing to bet that we're not giving them enough input, that they haven't had enough language going in. You know, you can't spend money you don't have, right? So if you don't put the money in the bank, you're going to have a hard time withdrawing it back out of the bank when you go to do that, right? If it's that they need some scaffolding or they they either like linguistically need it or they psychologically need some scaffolding, it's figuring out what that scaffolding is. Do they know where to find it? Did I even bring it to the online space, right? Is it a place that they can go click and find a list of words that they might need to do the thing? Is it that it's actually like I've seen some teachers do, they put sort of words in the virtual background space that a student can literally see it on the screen if they happen to need it, right? I think it's, again, it's that idea of prepping before you get to class, making sure you're going to have some contingency possibilities available if it's a language thing. And if it's not a language thing, I think it's a take a step back. It's not about you. Be minimally a safe, welcoming space for this human who is going to be sitting with you for, you know, an hour plus every day or every couple of days. Um, and then beyond that, sort of, if you can be an advocate for that person in your school and community online or not, uh, you know, that's awesome. But if we're talking about language specifically, I think there's a there's a lot of reasons why a student might not want to engage in interaction. The students have complicated relationships with one another at school that also have nothing to do with you. They also come to you from different backgrounds, right? They come like, Jinlao should probably has students that are of Chinese descent. They might speak Cantonese. They might speak Fuzhouhua. They might speak Mandarin at home. And those students have different relationships to speaking Mandarin than non-Chinese students. Being in a classroom where there are heritage students is intimidating and changes your relationship with the language. You know, you're real confident until someone comes along who's more proficient than you. And then suddenly you're scared and nervous and all of these things, right? So it's it really is understanding what the root of the struggle, we'll call it, is, and then sort of responding appropriately. And I think that goes certainly for online teaching but uh, would go for any classroom and space uh, anywhere, yeah. I would agree. And I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in the content and the online portion that sometimes we lose sight of the fact that there is this human at the other end of the computer and that is the person that you are working with. And I appreciate you really sharing your thoughts on how you kind of differentiate what is at the core? Is this more of a, just a being human and interpersonal relationships or confidence or is this something more of we just need to provide more input or provide different resources or scaffolding and, and I appreciate you breaking that down.